Over the past few weeks, the crypto art market has just gone absolutely bonkers. I have a bunch of photographer friends who have started selling their photographs and other art as NFTs and have been making some money at it. And it's really been amazing to see. But as the NFT market has really grown and, and just exploded over the past few weeks, we've seen a lot of really bad takes about the art market and a, a real misunderstanding of what gives things value. I thought this would be a good opportunity to look into NFTs, into the crypto art market, and into cryptocurrencies in general, and talk about how we as photographers and as artists can use this technology to simply help pay our bills. So I was planning on doing one video about all these subjects, and as I was outlining it out, it became apparent to me that I couldn't fit it all in one video. Otherwise, we'd be sitting here for an hour, and I didn't want to do that. So I've broken it up into four videos that I'm going to roll out throughout this week. Today, I'm going to be talking about the theory of cryptocurrencies, of crypto art, and just of what gives things value. Tomorrow, I'm going to be talking about one of the biggest issues that I've seen people raise regarding cryptocurrencies, and that's its environmental impacts and the way it drives uh, climate change. On Thursday, I'm going to be talking about how you as a photographer, as an artist, can get out there and create your crypto art and make some money to help support yourself and your art. And then Friday, I'm going to be talking a little bit about how the crypto art market is different than the traditional art market and how they're the same and how you can best position yourself to be successful as a crypto artist. So come along this week as we uh, do this four-part series, this deep dive on crypto art. Welcome to Grant Takes Pictures. I'm Grant, and I take pictures. As the crypto art market has blown up over the past few months, and especially over the past few weeks, a lot of people have been writing and tweeting about crypto art and about NFTs, and there's been just a lot of misunderstanding about the fundamental economics of what gives something value, what is a cost of an object, what speculation is and what investing is. And, you know, all of this confusion has led to people doing some, what I see as fairly dumb things when it comes to the crypto art space. So let's first talk about what gives an object value. Here in my pocket, I have an iPhone. I value this phone pretty highly. It's an expensive phone. A thousand dollars, I think, when it was new. It's expensive. It cost me a lot of money. But it was money I was happy to pay because I value this phone more than a thousand dollars worth. I've had it for three years. It's, uh, I use it constantly. I think, you know, I'm recording this on a Sunday, so it, it just popped up with my, you know, average screen usage for last week. And, uh, you know, I use it five hours a day on average, four and a half. That seems like a pretty good value to me. Four and a half hours a day for three years. So that's, uh, you know, call it a thousand days. So I've used it for 4,000 hours. You know, 25 cents an hour. That's a good value to me. Now, my dad, on the other hand, will look at this same phone and you would have to pay him to take it. Its value is less than zero. It would be a cost to him to take it. He's happy with his flip phone. So at a thousand dollars, he's not willing to pay that. And what this illustrates is that one object, this same phone here, can have different values to different people. So 
value is different than price. Now, the price of something is whatever amount of money the most people will spend to get it. So the company making it can make the most profit. Now, nowhere in here have I talked about the cost of actually producing the phone to the company as driving its value or really its price. As long as the price is above the cost of manufacturing it, the company will sell it. And they're gonna to try to sell as many of them as they can at the highest price possible. They wanna maximize their profit. That's something's intrinsic price. If you apply this to art, you know, if I have a photograph, if I print it out, hang it on my wall, you know, I have this one right back here, that has some value to me. The value to you might be different. So this photo here is the favorite photo I've ever taken, which is why it's right here at my desk. I get to look at it every day. Now, that has some sentimental value to me, and it is, um, the value to me is much higher than it would be to you. I sell a print of this on my website. You can go check it out at grantheninger.com. I have a limited edition of five of them, and they're priced at 100 bucks and nobody's bought one. I would pay 100 bucks for this photo, but it has a different value to me than it does to other people, clearly. So now let's apply that kind of same concept to money. So just normal, you know, good old greenbacks, right? A US dollar bill. This money is valued slightly differently. It has no intrinsic value. It is not worth anything. It's a piece of paper with some green ink on it. And yet, it can buy me anything, right? I mean, this $1 bill can't buy me anything, but if I have a stack of them, they can start adding up, and eventually, you know, if I have a big enough stack, they can buy me anything in the world, basically. Okay, maybe not anything. I probably can't go out and buy the Mona Lisa, but you get my point. What gives this dollar value? Most people will say that a dollar has value because we all say it has value. That I'm able to give it to somebody else and they can take it and use it to buy things. So I can, I can buy a t-shirt here with, you know, a stack of 40 of these. I get a t-shirt and the, you know, company that I buy them from can turn around and buy other stuff. You know, they can pay their employees. They can pay the the bamboo growers that create this, um, this fabric. We say that a dollar has value because we say it has value, but that's not really the case. This dollar bill is backed up by what, what they would say is the full faith and credit of the United States government. And what that means is that the government backs up the value of the dollar. Now, how can governments do that? You know, the, the crypto art, or the cryptocurrency folks will tell you that it's fiat currency, that it's you know just make believe, that it's no better than the the dollar bills in your monopoly game. But that's not true. What backs up the value of this dollar is the power of taxation and the monopoly on the legitimate use of force. So what that means is that the government can tax people. They can say you know, you've made a bunch of dollars, we want some of them. And if you don't give them to me, I'm gonna throw you in jail. Or to take that one step further, they can say, hey, you know, we need your farm or we need your factory and we're gonna take that by force. And yeah, we'll give you a few dollars, you know, for it, but you don't have an option in it, we're gonna take it. Because we need to go produce things that have value for people. And then the government now would own the means of production. And the government doesn't have to do that. Um, because they are legitimate, they're able to have that taxing power. But that taxing power is backed up by the use of force. That is truly what gives a dollar bill its value. So now that we have a solid understanding of the value of a dollar, let's talk about the value of cryptocurrencies. Now, I said that most people think that traditional currencies are uh, 
have value because we all say they have value, but that that's not really true for traditional currencies. It is very much true for cryptocurrencies that there is no taxing power, no legitimate monopoly on the use of force, and uh, nothing backing up the value of cryptocurrencies other than people's belief in the value of cryptocurrencies. So what exactly are cryptocurrencies if they're these things that people think have value that kind of don't? Just numbers in a computer. Now, most dollars are numbers in a computer these days too, but cryptocurrencies, that's really all they are, numbers in a computer. And the way cryptocurrencies work is that there's a one giant public ledger that has every transaction ever done on a cryptocurrency in this ledger. So if I transfer you five Ethereum or five Bitcoin, these are two different cryptocurrencies, that transfer of funds gets written down in this ledger and computers basically do a, uh, you know, a bunch of math on it and write it to the ledger and it is there for all eternity. Cryptocurrencies are held in crypto wallets and a wallet, a crypto wallet is like a real wallet that it can hold money, it can hold dollar bills or in the case of a, a cryptocurrency, it can hold Bitcoin or Ethereum or any number of other cryptocurrencies that have been created, but it also can hold pictures, it can hold scraps of paper, it can hold IDs, it can hold whatever else you kind of normally hold in a wallet, it can be held in a crypto wallet. When somebody does a transaction, let's say I have a photo in my cryptocurrency wallet and I want to sell it to you and you're gonna give me money for it. To ensure that that transaction happens, we will use a, a third party, a trusted third party, to hold everything. They will take your cryptocurrency, they will take my photo, and, and once they have everything, they do that swap. That ensures that you don't uh, get defrauded of your money. That makes sure that I don't give my photo to somebody who isn't gonna pay me. And this, this, uh, trusted third party is called a, a miner. You know, you'll hear about Bitcoin miners. There's also Ethereum miners. Um, those are the two biggest cryptocurrencies, which is why I keep on talking about both of them. The best way to think about miners is to think of it in terms of a, a real estate transaction. That when you buy a house, you send your money to an escrow company the person selling the house will transfer that, the title of the house to the escrow company. The escrow company takes everything and then distributes it out. You know, the seller gets the money, the buyer gets title to the house. That escrow company is a trusted third party. And the miners are a trusted third party. And what the miners do is they run the computers that do all the math to write these records to the, uh, to the blockchain, to this public ledger. And so these miners cost money. When you buy a house, you have to pay the escrow company. Miners are no different. So when you buy a house, there are closing costs. When you transfer something, when you buy something on the blockchain with cryptocurrency, you have to pay a fee. And that fee comes in different forms. So most crypto art is done on Ethereum. With Ethereum, you just pay the miner. You pay in what is called gas. There will be a gas fee and that money is paid in Ethereum and it goes to the miner. And that's how the miner makes money. And they have costs, they have to run the computers, they have to buy the computers, they have to pay for the electricity for the computers. The miners have real costs and they get paid for their work to run those computers, to keep the, the blockchain, to keep the entire cryptocurrency market working, to make sure that people can trade, to buy, to sell, 
and you know just have a, a functioning market. A lot of people who talk about what gives cryptocurrency value will talk about that cost, that that cost somehow generates value for cryptocurrencies. But that's not the case at all. Those transaction costs take value away from what you are spending and from what you are buying. Think of it in the terms of transferring, wire transferring dollar bills. Now, let's say I wanna send you $100 on Western Union. Now, I have $100 to send you. I want you to have the whole thing, but I don't have any more than $100. Western Union is going to charge a fee, though. Let's say they charge $10. So I take my $100, I go down to Western Union, I give it to them, I say, hey, go send this to you know, my friend down the street. Western Union will be like, okay, but we're gonna take $10 of it. So your friend down the street's only gonna get 90. Those transaction costs reduce the value of what you are getting by $10. It goes from $100 from me to $90 from you. And if Western Union increases their fee to $15, now you're only getting 85. So those transaction costs, instead of creating value for the currency, reduce value. That's one of those big misconceptions about why some people think that cryptocurrencies have value because of these transaction costs. And that's absolutely completely backwards. They just don't want to admit that cryptocurrencies have value because people say they have value and nothing else. This has been an interesting discussion about the value of money and how that value is derived, but how does it relate to crypto art and to how you as a a photographer or as an artist can make money on the crypto art market. Well, people are selling their art using NFTs or non-fungible tokens. Now these NFTs, some people call them nifties. I don't like it all that much. I'm gonna keep on using NFT. These NFTs are just a, a series of letters and numbers that somebody holds in their cryptocurrency wallet and can be transferred on the blockchain. So you can transfer it in exchange for Ethereum. And all of these NFTs are, so these NFTs or non-fungible tokens are really a certificate of authenticity. When you buy a fancy piece of art, the artist will provide a, a certificate of authenticity. And depending on what you're buying, it might be that really that's all you're ever gonna get. There was one artist who did a, a modern art piece that was a banana duct taped to a wall. And somebody paid a huge sum of money for this piece of art. But it's a banana, it's gonna go bad, and it's duct taped to a wall, somebody can take it down. And actually that's what happened, somebody took it down and ate the banana. The person who bought this piece of art still had the certificate of authenticity. They still had something saying that, well, they owned that piece of art. Um, it's a, a weird concept to say you own something that no longer exists, but there you have it. So when you are buying an NFT, really what you are buying is, is a certificate of authenticity saying that you own the piece of art. Why would anybody just buy this certificate of authenticity saying they own art? Really, this comes down to what the value of art is there's kind of two schools of thought. One is the intrinsic value of art or how much utility or enjoyment you're gonna get from that art. And the other is how much you can resell it for. You know, if it can be uh, an investment. But I would say that, you know, any investment in art is, um, it's really just speculation. That if you are buying a piece of art just because you think you can sell it to somebody else for more money, you're a, a bit of a fool, and you're hopeful that you can find a, a greater fool to sell it to. In fact, this is called the greater fool theory in investing. Now, if you're buying the art because you like it, or because you want to support the artist, if you, have, if you get joy and value from the art itself, 
that is something completely different. That has true intrinsic value. So a lot of the people who are buying NFTs right now, who are buying crypto art, are doing it because they want to support the artist. The artist has a good story. The artist is a friend. Um, whatever it is, you know, they're doing it really to support the artist, not as um, as an investment with the thoughts of reselling it later on. So really, in this way, the NFT market, the crypto art market, is not really different than the traditional art market. The, the value and the, the reasons people are buying crypto art are no different than the reasons people buy physical art. You know, it's to hang up on their wall you know, or it's to support the artists. So all of those reasons are all the same or some people are buying it because they think they can make money off of it. Those people are fools. So that's the overview and the, the foundation we need to understand why the crypto art market exists and what is giving all of these pieces of art value. So like I said, tomorrow we're going to have a, a video on the climate impacts of cryptocurrencies and of crypto art in general. On Thursday, we are going to look at how you can create your own NFTs and participate in the crypto art market. And Friday, we will, like I said, look at um, how to make the most value from the crypto art market as, a, as an artist yourself. So thank you very much uh, for sitting through this. I hope you learned something. I hope it was um, edifying and that uh, you know, if you have any feedback, leave a comment below. But if you've liked this video, hit that like button. If uh, you wanna see the rest of this series, hit that subscribe button. It'll be coming out the rest of the week. And until tomorrow, have a great day.